Hi guys, this is Lauren with Lauren Watkins Art and today I'm going to be painting a winter landscape for you using soft pastels. I used a variety of brands of pastels and this is the color palette I ended up picking out for the painting. I used the Mangayo Gallery pastels. They have this wrapper. This is the Unison soft pastels. So you'll see some that are of Unison brand in here. These thick rectangular ones are Terry Ludwig soft pastels. These narrow ones are Prismacolor new pastels. And the thicker one on the right is a Faber Castell soft pastel. And then there's Richardson's handmade soft pastels in the mix. For the underpainting, I used a mixture of three colors of Bombay India inks in violet, blue, and orange. The India inks are alcohol based and we will talk about that in a minute. So I used a pastel pencil and a ruler to get my horizon line and then I used the pastel pencil to just sketch in the basic shapes while looking at my reference photo. I chose a light blue color because it's one that would blend in with everything else that I was doing. I prefer to sketch my pastel pieces out either using a pastel pencil or I prefer to draw it on a piece of paper and transfer it using transfer paper. I struggle with using a pencil because it, on the sanded paper it collects so much of the graphite in the sanded paper that it can smudge and it can make my pieces look a little bit muddy. And so this is just my preferred method in working. So I'm just looking at my reference photo and just sketching out basic shapes. I'm not being precious. I'm not being 100% accurate. I'm just kind of blocking in the shapes and then I will fine tune it and adjust it as I go along. Once I have the basic sketch done, I pull out my inks and I start blocking in shapes and adding the underpainting. Now, India inks are alcohol based, and so if I need a color thinned down or diluted, I use rubbing alcohol. This is great because it dries quickly and I don't have to worry about my paper staying wet, but it does cause the alcohol to flow out a little bit more so it can bleed more once I add the rubbing alcohol to it. To combat that, I will try to be judicious on how much rubbing alcohol I add when diluting, and I will keep a paper towel next to me to kind of dab up if it's running out of control. Luckily, this is just the underpainting, so I don't have to be too particular. I um, made sure that I put the oranges where I wanted the where it to be warm where I wanted it to have the sun hitting the tree. In the areas that I added the blues, that's just where I wanted some general cool tones, um, where I wanted it to be a little bit more in shadow, the snow, and then I used the violets for the dark, dark shadows where it's almost black. Now you'll see the pink in a few spots. That is because this is a very dirty palette. You can see it in the bottom and when I added rubbing alcohol to one of the wells um, to dilute the violets it added it picked up some of the dried magenta um, ink and so it was on my brush and so I just used it as a shadow you can just use some diluted violet for that shadow so it doesn't have to be, be magenta by any means so once I blocked in the basics of the trees kind of marked where I wanted to, the sun to hit and where I wanted it to be more in shadow. I started blocking in some more of the snow and the shadows within the snow. And I'm just using a mixture of blues and violets for this. And I am using quite a bit of rubbing alcohol to kind of help dilute it and help spread it. Um, I don't want it to be super dark. I'm just trying to block it in, partly just so I keep track of the areas in the painting. This started because when I first started using pastels, I didn't have very many darks. And when I started using an ink, like a black ink to mark in the shadows of the piece, it made it so I could get my darks dark enough easier. 
The underpainting also allows you to start toning your picture. So the pastels you lay on top of these ink layers are going to be affected by the color of the past of the paper underneath. And so adding a, like a vibrant undertones like I am today, it's going to add an extra vibrancy to the piece. But I also find that doing this underpainting process for me helps me kind of work through how I want to approach the picture when I start using the pastels. So this is kind of just a warm up exercise to get me in the mode of working on this piece, if that makes sense. This was one, this was one of my first, this might have been my first painting of the new year and I just wanted to have fun and play with it and so I just didn't really set a plan. I found a reference photo I liked and pulled out the materials I thought I wanted for it and just got to work after a year of doing a lot of most of the paintings I did were commissioned pieces it was really nice to just find something that inspired me and just start painting now I will link the reference photo I used for this below but I can't share it on my YouTube channel it's from a website called paint my photo and it's a fantastic website to get references for your paintings, but you aren't allowed to share it on like social media and things like that. You can share your, your painting, but you can't share the actual photo. You'll have to set up an account to view it, but if you want to find this reference photo and use it yourself, I will leave a link down below. Once the ink underpainting was completely dry, which only took a minute, I then started in with the soft pastels. I am being really careful to not push hard at this stage because I want to build up lots and lots of layers. And so I'm just using a light hand and building up the layers and kind of building that gradient of color that you see in the sky. So the sky looks darker the further away it is from us. And then as it gets closer to the earth, it gets lighter. That's atmospheric perspective and so I'm trying to keep that in mind as I'm building up these colors in the sky. Another thing I'm doing is I am bouncing the colors in the sky into the snow. Snow's white but you can't just paint a solid white field of, of snow on the ground and have it look realistic snow reflects the colors around it and so snow can be very colorful that's part of what makes it so fun to paint and draw because there's so many colors that you can add to it so the colors i add to the sky i am adding to the snow i'm now blocking in some more of the darks and the shadows in this picture i wanted to get some of those really dark tones in to use it as a gauge to know how bright and how dark and the range of mid-tones I had to work with. Um, a lot of artists will put their lightest and their darkest values in the picture at the beginning of the piece because it makes it easier for them to gauge their mid-tones and know how far to push them one way or, or another. But I'm just kind of blocking them in. Again, I didn't really have any rhyme or reason with this piece. Looking back at the footage, I realized I didn't follow a lot of the things that I normally do with, with a painting. And, you know, I, it's quite liberating. Sometimes we get stuck in a rut as artists. We figure out a way that works for us and we forever paint that specific way. We paint in that specific order and that gets really mundane and really boring. And so sometimes it's fun to change up our routine and change how we approach things. It may not be something that we continue to do, but it can re-energize us and make us excited. So you can see in the picture, I added some more to the sky and I worked on that gradient where it goes from dark to mid-tone to light and 
it also got warmer in tone. If you look at the sky, it's a lot cooler of a blue the higher up it is, but as it gets closer to the earth, it also it becomes a warmer blue, and I wanted to play that up in this piece. But going back to changing up our routines, when I was, I didn't have a big plan for this picture, and I was going mostly by just how I felt. I had music on, my kids were distracted, playing video games with their dad on Christmas break, and I just dived into my studio and had fun playing. But I knew I wanted to kind of change up my routine. I didn't use any pen pastels for this piece and I didn't want to use very many pastel pencils. I just wanted to use traditional pastels and a little bit of ink and see what I could create. This black thing in my hand that I'm blending with is pipe insulation foam. I got it from Home Depot. I bought a big long tube of it a couple years ago. It was probably five years ago and I still have quite a bit left. It is really durable and it can withstand blending on sanded paper quite well. And that was another thing I've kind of brought back. I used to blend a lot with pipe insulation foam and then I stopped and I started using different techniques. And I'm, I find that I'm kind of coming back to things that I kind of put aside and trying them and getting different results than I used to. Having that experience with other ways of working and pushing myself in that way, when I come back to the old things, I find new and exciting ways to use them and how much to use them. So I'm just using it to blend just gently in this picture. I'm not trying to over blend. I want it to be one of those pictures where if you're close up, you can see all the individual strokes and the texture but as you stand back it all kind of comes together to a harmonious painting. Once I got the sky blended out and the main darks blocked in on the trees I could start coming in and blocking in the leaves. Now in the reference photo there's very specific areas where the sun is hitting the trees a lot stronger and it's creating a glow on those leaves and so I'm looking at that reference photo a lot and using my light pastels to really start blocking in those areas where the sun is sunlight's making those leaves almost glow a bright green. I'm then gradually building up the dark greens around those brighter areas. And I'm making sure not to cover up too much of those highlighted spots because in order to make it look like that sunlight is reflecting it and making it glow in the leaves, I need to keep those highlights. And I'm just looking at the reference photo, seeing what areas need to be darkened and leaving the rest to be more of this bright green color. I'm also taking care not to make the leaves on my trees look too solid. When you look at a tree, you can usually see little glimpses of the sky kind of poking through. And so I'm making sure that I'm allowing enough space to, to have the sky poking through in the picture. That's gonna make it look like it's more little leaves on the trees instead of like this big massive block of color. Once I got done kind of blocking in the base colors of the branches and the leaves and pine needles on these trees, I started coming in and adding more detail where it looks like individual branches. You can see some of the pine needles on the pine trees. And the reason why I didn't start off with that is because the further something away, the further something is away from us, the less detail we're going to see. We'll see the block of color, we might see the general overarching shape, but we won't see the tiny details. So a, like a pine tree branch, you can see the block of color, you can tell that it may be an individual branch, but you're not gonna see the individual pine needles on that tree. And if I had started this picture, started blocking in the pine needles and leaves on the trees by adding all the detail and drawing individual leaves and branches 
what would have happened is the picture would have ended up looking very flat because there would have been no difference between the leaves that were further away or the needles that were further away to the ones that are close up and it will make everything visually look like it's on the same plane or the same field of vision. I know it's tempting to want to add detail everywhere in a picture. Um, I th we tend to think that will make something look more realistic, but it actually doesn't work like that. It can make things look off. It can make things look flat. It can make them look not quite right because our eyes don't work like that. And if we're going to try and draw a picture that mimics what we see, or even what a camera sees, we need to make that differentiation on things that are further away and things that are closer together. It's why we sometimes make things that are further away look more blue and grayed out in value versus things that are closer. It's that same concept of creating depth. It's also why we make things at it that are far away smaller than the things that are close together. So something to keep in mind when you are trying to create depth in your pieces. It also saves time. It would take so long to draw every single individual branch and pine needle in this piece. It would drive me nuts. And so you don't have to do it and you get more time to do other things in your picture. So here I am just taking a variety of dark greens and building up the layers in the pine tree and building up the, the detail on these pine trees that are closer up. And something I want to talk about as well is the colors I used for this picture. I didn't choose a true black for this piece. Um, there's a lot of artists that don't use black ever, a true black ever in their paintings. I like black and it serves a purpose, but sometimes it's easy to get too dependent on it in getting our darks dark enough. And I'm a, and it can look flat in our pieces and I'm guilty of doing it when we just use straight black. Because I was feeling like switching things up when I was working on this piece, I purposely chose not to use a pure black pastel. I wanted to try and challenge myself to use the whole spectrum of, va of values and work on my use of midtones in in the painting. So for my dark darks in this piece, I used really dark blues, I used really dark greens, and I used the violet that I had in the underpainting with the ink. And I really liked how it turned out. It felt like there was a lot more warmth. It didn't look as flat when it was all finished. Sometimes the colors don't translate as well in the videos, but it had a lot more warmth and life to it. And the Terry Ludwig pastels are fantastic at, at giving you really dark darks, but having color in those darks. So it's not too black. There's some life with other colors in the undertones and I, I really like using them for that purpose. If you are having a hard time getting your darks to be dark enough in your picture um, and you're using like a straight black pastel, it means that the your other values need to be lightened up just a bit and you need to have more variation in the values in your picture. I talk a lot about this with whites because it's more of a common problem with white where people will be using pure white for their highlight on a picture and it's still not bright enough. It's not standing out and that's because the values next to that white aren't dark enough to make it stand out. It's really important in our pictures to have quite a variation in values. And if you're having a hard time knowing if your values are correct or if you need to adjust them or where you need to adjust them, there's a couple ways that you can check. You can take a photo of your piece and turn it black and white. Just lower the saturation on it. I wouldn't use a filter because sometimes filters 
adjust other things, but just take a picture and just drop the saturation all the way down. That will give you an idea of what areas look too similar and need a change in value, what things are too dark, what things are too light. Because if, if your picture looks flat in black and white, it's because there's not enough differentiation in value. You could have all the colors be different, but if the values of those colors are too similar, it's going to look flat. And if you don't know what value is, it's how light or dark a color is. So you could have a pale red, a medium red color, and a dark red color. Those are differences in value. Another way to check the value of your picture, if you're not gonna use your phone, is to take a step back from it. So take a step a few feet away from it, look at it from a distance and kind of squint. That will kind of make it so you can kind of see what things are looking too similar and what things need to be adjusted. It does a similar thing as the photo, it kind of flattens it out and you can see what really needs to be tweaked. So as I've been on my value rant, you can see that I've been working on the picture and refining and adding more shadows and trying to build up the basic shapes within the snow. So where there's gonna be a little hill of snow, where it divots down a little bit, where it's kind of been rutted out from, from like a snow plow or a car driving in, starting to build up those shapes and that dimension in the snow so, so it doesn't look too flat. I'm also working on refining the bushes in the background and just building up this picture. With every painting you do, there's always a stage where you kind of get discouraged because it doesn't look very good or it looks worse than it did a few moments before. And this was kind of that stage for me in the painting and I was getting a little discouraged <laughs> because it, it just was looking, especially the trees on the right hand side were looking very flat and dimensionless, dimensionless to me and I, I just didn't like them and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do to adjust it. The first thing I did was add pale yellow to the highlighted areas in the snow. This is because I wanted kind of that warm afternoon sun to look like it was reflecting off of the snow and to add a nice warm and cold contrast in the lighting. Because um, things that are tend to be warm tend to be more yellow and red and orange in undertone and things that are cooler in value tend or feel colder tend to be more blues and dark purples and so I wanted to play that up in the snow to really help reinforce it looking like the sun is hitting some of the trees and other trees are more in shadow and so I added the yellows to help play that up. You'll see that sometimes I have some tape holding down the edges of the paper I'm working on when I start and then I gradually peel it off. That's because the paper might have a tendency to kind of bubble up or kind of warp on me as I start and so I tape it down so it doesn't move too much and then as I work I take the tape off because the paper has relaxed and it's not going to warp and bubble on me and it keeps the, paper, the tape from getting in my way. If I don't take the tape off, even if that section was going to be behind a mat when it was framed it will create kind of a halo effect around the tape because I can't get my pastels right up in those sections so I just take the tape off as I progress in the picture. The other thing you can see that I've been doing is I've been adding more color to the stumps of or the tr tree trunks. That's because as I was working I, and trying to figure out why I didn't like it, it, it was because I felt like the, the tree still looked a little flat and uninteresting. And so I started pulling in some fun colors into the tree trunks. Now it will still read brown from a distance. I'm just pulling in these colors to help create visual interest and dimension in the pieces. 
I'm using violets in the trees on the right that are in shadow to help create dimension and have a little bit of warmth but still read cool and have them be interesting but not compete with the trees that are more on the left that are being hit with the sun. With those trees I'm using a lot more oranges, a lot more reds, and a lot more bright yellows to help reinforce that they're warm because they're in the sun and to differentiate them from the trees on the right. And now I'm just refining the picture even more. I'm looking at my reference photo and comparing it to my painting and seeing what needs to be tweaked and refined and adjusted. It's kind of a back and forth process when you're painting. You look at your reference photo and you kind of see what it looks like and then you compare it to what you're painting, especially if you're going for really realistic pieces. If you're going for super realistic paintings, hyper realism, whatever you want to call it, you will spend more time looking at your reference photo than you will actually painting. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. If you're trying to get all the small details and try to make it as realistic as possible for you, you've got to look at the minutia and and do subtle details and subtle tweaking and being really critical of what's there and what you're doing. And so you will spend more time looking at your reference photo. This piece, I wasn't trying to replic replicate the, the photo exactly. I was using it as a guide for shapes of trees and, and as a guide for shadows and how the sun was hitting things and what things would be in highlight and what things would be in shadow and kind of those values that would come along with it. So how much you look at your reference photo will really depend on what you're trying to achieve. But I was looking at my reference photo a lot at this stage to get the general shape and really refine how the light was hitting the different objects in this piece. When I was working on this piece, about halfway, I realized I wanted to focus mostly on the lighting. I love light and I love seeing how the sun hits things and how it, how it creates this kind of glow on some things and the cool shadows, especially in the winter time. It's, it's just really magical, magical to me. Lighting is like my favorite thing to see. And so I was using my reference photo a lot to, to know how to do the lighting in this piece and really play that up and have it be one of the main things you notice about it. The other thing I really wanted you to feel like when you were looking at this piece is that you were standing in the middle of the trail and have it be like you just paused to take a break while snowshoeing and you were just kind of looking around you. Probably because I like to go snowshoeing and cross-country skiing and my husband always teases me because I'm always way behind everyone else that comes with us because I stop and take so many pictures and I wanted to kind of get that feeling in this picture where you just stop because it's just so beautiful. You just had to take a break and look at it. You can see I'm still playing up the colors and trying to create that glow in this piece and just fine tuning and adjusting. I'm bringing in a few more browns and some rusty reds into the piece to kind of adjust it to make sure it still reads brown when you stand and look at it from a distance, but have it be colorful and kind of interesting and fun when you get close and look at it um, in full detail. This is also the stage in a painting where I'll work on it for a little bit and I'll take a break and I'll come back to it a few minutes later with fresh eyes, I'll step back and look at it from a distance, kind of like what we talked about earlier, and just gauge and do that fine tuning so that I can just gradually bring it to where I'm happy with it. Because at this stage, 
you don't need to do a ton. It's just small adjustments to make it perfect or perfect for you. And so when you're about 90% done with a piece, I always recommend take a break, come back to it with fresh eyes, and then work on it and to take steps back regularly so you can see the adjustments. Towards the end of this piece, I did just a tiny bit of blending using a little rubber shaper. It's a little tool with a little rubber end and it kind of smudges what you've done and, and smooths it out. And I just use that mostly on the tracks in the snow to help give them a little bit more form and a little bit more dimension. I also reinforce the shadows in those tracks to help them look dimensional as well. So that's about it with this painting. Um, I hope you found this kind of walkthrough and demonstration helpful. I know it's not a step-by-step -step tutorial, but I hope my insight on what I'm doing and what I'm thinking while I'm doing a painting helps you know how to analyze and work through your pieces in the future. I hope you have a fantastic day. And if you like this video, please hit the like button. And if you want to see more of my content, please hit the subscribe button and notification bell. Have a fantastic day. Bye.